Yeah. Good enough to see now? All right, so this is showing you what a good overhang looks like. This is on June 21st. This is a clear story up here at the top where I can't reach. I forgot my pointer, too. Um, so you can see that th this overhang will let the winter sun in, and it will keep the summer sun out. This is in the summertime. This is the only log house that I actually like. It's called Sing Logs. They're made down in McCleary, Washington, which is right around by Shelton. And the guy who invented this system is a very clever guy. His name's Peter Sing, which is where he got Sing Logs. He takes small diameter cedar trees. They're like 8 to 10 inches in diameter. And they're, they're you know, full of knots and branches. You, you've seen an 8 to 10 inch diameter cedar tree. <laughs> they don't get used for much until they get really big. Well, he can use these things, and he squares them, and runs them through a mill, and turns them into a square log. And then he quarters it and turns the pieces inside out because the heartwood is the part that's most dimensionally stable and it's also the prettiest. You don't have quite as many knots in the center of the tree as you do in the outer. And he turns it inside out and he puts a two by four spacer in between these two three inches pieces of cedar. So you've got this log that's six to 16 inches long, or sorry, six feet to 16 feet long, three inches of cedar, three inches of cedar, and a three and a half inch air space in between the two pieces of wood. And you stack them up together. You lay them down on a, a bed of urethane glue, and you attach them with only log screws, which are these big honking screws, and you build a house out of them. And when you're done, I mean, the, the people that built this house, she's a therapist, and she makes really big sculptures. None of them, neither of them had any construction experience at all. And they built this house by themselves, pretty much. And uh, so they did the walls. The roof is all made out of structural insulated panels, which are kind of styrofoam sandwiches. It's 7 16 inch oriented strand board, and then 4, 6, 8, 12, 16 inches of styrofoam in between, and then another piece of oriented strand board on the outside. And these things come out to the job site 4 feet wide and up to 26 feet long. And the structural support is actually in the, in the, in the stress skin panel. So they bring them out on a crane truck. We had the we had the beam, and if we were looking at the side of the building, it'd be easier to see, but there's a beam underneath that clear story up above. And so that beam was already set. They brought in the lower panels, and they set them on the beam, and they ran the log screws right through into the beam. Then that clear story wall up above was already framed. They stood that up. Then they laid the ones on top, and they screwed right into that. The panels come with metal straps already on them. That whole roof went up in four hours. So for a truly vaulted ceiling, structural insulated panels are the way to go. And you know, there's the other advantage of this is normally up at the top of this roof where it meets that clear story up above, normally you have to have ventilation up there because any warm, moist air that makes it into the insulation has, has to have a way to get out in the wintertime. With the structural insulated panels, you don't have to have ventilation. So it's really nice where you've got a roof dying into a vertical wall because if you try and put a vent at that point, if you get wind and water coming from that direction, you'll get water inside your attic. So roof ventilation is a good thing. I think it's, it's code and it's a smart idea. But if you use structural insulated panels, you don't have to mess with it, which is an advantage. And the foundation is made out of um, insulating concrete forms. So have you seen those? They're, they're kind of cool. They're like three inches of styrofoam. And they bring them out on the job site. Some of them are already blocks with an eight inch void in the middle. Some of them, they come out as panels, and you piece them together with plastic ties. So you set them up. You make your forms out of the styrofoam. Then they, this, the little ties have saddles where you can put the structural steel in there, vertical and horizontal steel for reinforcing of the wall. And then you fill them full of concrete. And you've got an insulated concrete wall. And you never have to strip your formwork. It's a code wall. It's a pretty slick system. There are some that are made out of recycled polystyrene and concrete, which I like even better. It's called Rastra. These are like quad lock, uh, diamond snap, arcs, logics, uh, polysteel. There's a bunch of companies that make insulating concrete forms. Make sure they're UA, or, um, ICBO approved, ICC approved now. But the nice thing about the Rastra is that you're not isolating the concrete from the living space. Because if you've got three inches of styrofoam between your house and that concrete, that concrete doesn't count as thermal mass. 
you got three inches of styrofoam in there. That's an R10 between you and the concrete. You're not going to get the benefit of it. So let's go to the next one here. Yeah, so this shows the side. Yeah, this, this one's in backwards. That's the one that we pulled out. This is the west side. I had these windows sized a little bit smaller, but you can see right directly above there is where the beam was, and then there's the clear story wall. The beautiful thing about a clear story as opposed to a skylight, skylights will gain a ton of heat in the summertime, and they will lose a ton of heat in the wintertime. So I really like clear stories better because a clear story is a vertical window, so you can make it open, like if you do an awning window that, oh, that hinges at the top. Even if you forget to close it and it rains, who cares? You're not going to get water in your house. And you can have an overhang, and that overhang will stop the sun from coming in in the summertime. Clear stories also give you natural light and ventilation. They will give you natural light to north-facing rooms and solar gain to north-facing rooms. They give you privacy. And I think they look kind of cool. I mean, it's, it's a modern, modern look. But yeah, and there's the north-facing clear story over here. So her floor level is actually down here. And this is where they lived while they were building. That was the kitchen, actually. They lived in a yurt. A yurt's another very cool structure. It's, you know, Tibet nomadic tribes. And I've put up a couple of those, too. All right, next one. This is what it looks like from inside. So you can see the, the knotty character of the Sing log. Clear story makes a nice vaulted thing. If you're going to do a small house, which it's always best to do as small as you can really live with. And if you have somebody who's good at space planning, it's amazing how small a house can be. This house is about 1,200 square feet for two people. And it feels big because it's got these vaulted ceilings. It's got overhead light. It's got a really open floor plan. An open floor plan is really good for natural convection and natural heat transfer. All right, next one. And that's Blanchett High School. That's another example of a clear story. One of the things that I noticed was that the overhang was too deep. The, the architect drew it up like this for aesthetic reasons. And when I did my calculations, well, you can see it in this picture. Look how much of this window up above here is being shaded right there. That picture was taken in November. Sunlight should have been pretty much going full stream through that glass right up to the top. And so I mentioned it to him, and he said, it's already in fabrication. Can't change it now. Deal with it. So one of the recommendations I made was, we'll paint the roof in front of this clear story white, and that will act as a reflector, and it'll bounce a bunch more energy up in through the glass. It'll also keep that roof a lot cooler in the summertime, and it will increase the longevity of the roof. Green roofs are something that are coming into vogue right now. It's an expensive way to do a roof, but having a living roof, you can add as little as 10 pounds a square foot to the weight of the roof, and it will double the life of the roof. In Europe, you actually have to pay more money if you don't do a green roof, because it also stops rainwater runoff in a big storm. That green roof will, will keep the storm sewer from getting overwhelmed. And it gives insulating value, and it protects the roof. And most things, depending on what you plant up there, the roots are not that invasive. There's a lot of layers to doing a green roof, so that's why I say it's expensive. It's not a cheap roof, but it's a pretty cool thing. All right, next one. So they put these streamers in here to help diffuse some of the light because they were getting direct gain right through those windows. And you can see, I think you can see the shadow. Nah, not on this one. On another picture, you can see the shadow line. But there's the solar mass. You know, I figured out how many cubic feet of books there were, and that was thermal storage. And they didn't even require us to have so many percent of books in the library at any one time. <laughs> and to be honest, you know, the city didn't know anything about the solar ordinance. I knew more about it than they did. So I kind of, I, I wouldn't say I fudged on it, but the way I came up with Density of cellulose, because that's what I use for the specific heat. Books are basically paper, which is cellulose. So to come up with the density, I just took about a cubic foot of books, and I set them on my bathroom scale, and that's how I came up with the density. And, you know, they weren't going to argue it. So I proved that they would store enough heat. Next one. Ah, here you can see the shading right up above here. Yeah, that was, that was the day before uh, Thanksgiving break. And about the top quarter of those windows were shaded. And that's not right. They should have, one of the things they could have done, instead of having the overhang be like this, they could have splayed it. So that the, that outer edge was still protecting it in the summertime, but the winter sun came down at an angle instead of just being stopped right there. 
I don't know. That must have been the architect. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really pretty. It's all shimmery, and, and it's nice. It helps diffuse the light so it's not cooking everything down below because they did use clear glass. But they were allowed to go, I think they went another 12 feet over what the building code would have allowed. So it was pretty nice. And we did a house just last year on the west side of Finney Ridge, and the roof is this unisolar stuff. He was allowed to go up, I think we cheated five feet. Well, it's not cheating because it's allowed, but we, we went five feet over code. And at one point, I think we went in for a pre-application meeting to find out what their concerns were going to be, and I asked him about going above based on the solar panels, and he said, well, no, you can't use that because you could put those panels on the lower roof. And my client started to say something. I just kind of jabbed him. And um, I said, we're just going to draw it. He says, no, he told us we can't do it. I said, that's him. You know how many people work here? You ask somebody else, and you're going to get a different answer. So I'm going to draw it up, and I'm going to reference the director's rule, which is 13-2002. And I'll just put it on the drawings, and then we can argue it. But you know, if we'd gotten approval at that point, I would have documented it. But the fact that we got disapproval, it's like, no, I'll just ask somebody else. And I know I've got the law on my side here. You just have to be able to document it. But it wasn't the right place to make an argument with the building department. You know, you have to pick your battles with those guys. And of course, when we turned it in, he looked at it and he went, oh, looks like you're at uh, 39.6 feet. You know, the code says 35. And I said, yeah, except for this. And then I pulled out the director's rule, 13-2002. He said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, those are solar panels up there. Huh? Oh, that looks nice. I like those. Deal. Done. All right, next one. I don't know of any other cities. I know that Kent actually has a solar access ordinance, which I would love it if Seattle would have one. And I, I may be wrong about this. It was years ago that I used that, but I was amazed to find that Kent has a solar access ordinance, meaning if you want to do a second-story addition on your house, you have to be able to prove to the building department that you're not shading your next door neighbor's solar site. It's pretty cool. I mean, developers and contractors hate it. They got enough to deal with that without having to figure sun angles and whether they're going to be shading their neighbor or not. But if you put $10,000 worth of solar panels up on your roof, last thing you want is your neighbor making that system worthless because he wants a little more space upstairs. There's the happy solar heated Catholic high school students. All right, next one, Rick. And this is a trom wall. We haven't talked about trom walls yet, but a trom wall is basically double pane glass or plastic, four inch airspace, and then an eight inch thick concrete wall. And what happens is the sunlight, can you focus that a little bit? Sunlight passes through the plastic or the glass. It hits the concrete wall, it turns to heat, and then for each inch of concrete, it takes one hour for that thermal wave to migrate through the wall. So the wall is collecting heat from 9 to 3. It's radiating to the bedroom from 5 to 11. So it's really, really good for bedrooms. Now, can you focus that a little, Rick? I don't think the, yeah, you've got to do it by hand. There you go. Thank you. Um, this is his overhang. This, this picture was taken in, I think that was October. So he's starting to get sun onto the whole wall. This little box up here, right above where I'm pointing, this side of the wall was sized perfectly for the master bedroom, so we had our 150 pounds of masonry for each square foot of south-facing glass. This side of the wall was oversized for the master bathroom, but I didn't want to stop the concrete two feet from the end of the building because it's holding up the second floor system. So we vented the airspace. So the airspace is separated right here. This is an unvented trom wall, and this is a vented trom wall. So during the day, that airspace gets up to 150 degrees. It dumps warm air up into the living space, and it pulls cool air um, from the bathroom and the hallway to replace it. For about, well, he says 1000 bucks. I'll call it 2000 including labor. For $2,000 during construction, he's getting 50% of the space heat for that house for the life of the house. The plastic is um, crystallite from, in Everett. And it is UV stabilized. You have to make sure that that's UV stabilized so that it doesn't degrade. Because plastic, normally, if it's not UV grade plastic, it will turn yellow and brittle within two years. So it's not worth doing. You'd be better off with glass. But the double pane plastic, um, it's got the same R or same U value as double pane glass. 
it's half the cost and it's a lot easier to work with. So I really like the plastic. So for 50%, you know, for $2,000, he's getting half the space seat for the life of the house. That's the south side. So he's got direct gain up above. Direct gain is just south facing windows. Got direct gain going into living room, dining room, and kitchen. Then this is his emergency fire escape from the bedroom. Bedroom goes to here. Master bathroom is here. Um, I forget what that room is. I did this house in 1990, so it's been a while. And he cut off the corner of the house. If we'd done this house as a rectangle, it probably would have cost the same amount as cutting off that corner, but you know, he wanted to do something different. And my feeling is that I, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to design. I always figure that you make the structure simple to build, and then you can put your money into finishes and solar where it's going to count. Whereas most architects, they draw pretty pictures, and then they give it to an engineer, and he makes it work, and the thing typically comes in 10 to 20% over budget. And I, I, I don't like that. That's why I charge by the hour instead of by the percentage. Architects typically charge by the percentage, they get 12 to 20% of the cost of the project. So it's in their interest to make that project as expensive to build as possible. And they go over budget regularly. Um, if you pay by the hour, then if you're good at making up your mind, you save money, and if you're not, then you pay for it. So yeah, 50%, that's what a 50% solar house looks like. And that's probably even, he might even be doing better than that because he's one of these people that he doesn't mind wearing his sweater into November. Last year, he never turned on his space heat until the middle of November. I wouldn't live like that. I mean, it's, it's like 50-something degrees in there in November. You get a week where there's no sunshine. It's, but it's not freezing, and he's not home much, so that was fine for him. And the direct gain works. Even if you get an hour or two of sun during the day, the direct gain will heat the space up. We did R50 in the ceiling because he's sort of under the flight path. This is on the south, south end of Whidbey Island. He's got a killer view. I'll bet you that's the next slide. No, nope, that's the inside of the wall. This is back when I thought that the inside of the wall had to be dark colored. So he did these tiles himself. He works at Boeing, and this was a, a weekend project for him to make these tiles. They're kind of pretty. But he could have done a mural in here now, knowing what I know now. That wall could look like anything you want, and it's not going to change the emittance, radiance characteristics of the wall at all. Next. So that's his view. A little focus, please. Yeah, this is a good solar site. <laughs> you know, that's a wetland. There's never going to be big trees growing out there. And that's kind of what you want. Actually, a south-facing hillside is even better, because if you can bury your house into the ground, then instead of having these big temperature differences between inside and outside, that outside of that wall that's buried in the ground is always 50 degrees. You go down two feet, even in eastern Washington. And the ground is always 50 degrees. So it's a nice, constant temperature. When I gave up my basement office, when I built my new one, I really missed it in the summertime. In the wintertime, it was always kind of cold because that wall was sucking heat from me. But in the summertime, it was beautiful. All right, next. This is Lopez Community Land Trust. This is their third low-income co-housing. It's called Innisfree. And we got a grant from the Department of Energy for $42,000 to do passive solar on this eight-unit co-housing development. And they're getting about 34% of their space heat from the added insulation, super air sealing, better windows. And then these little guys right here are like mini trom walls. They're little brick walls underneath a window seat. And the sunlight passes through the glass, hits these little brick walls, and then the brick wall is on the face of the window seat, so if you're sitting in the living room or the kitchen or the dining room or anywhere downstairs, because it's a really open floor plan, then these brick walls are radiating heat to you. The reason there are no overhangs on the south wall to speak of is because it's Lopez Island. If it gets over 70 degrees up there, they're thrilled. There's not an overheating problem. But I always have to explain that, because if you show this to you know, people that know solar, it's like, oh yeah, oh, okay, where's the overhang up there on the top floor? That place is going to cook in the summertime. Not on Lopez. I did have to fight with the architect a little bit because I was getting paid and he wasn't. And so he wasn't listening to me like at all. He made the houses long on the east-west side and short on the north-south side. And he used to have the porches. You, know, you can see one of the porches over here. These porches used to be on the south wall. So he had an eight-foot roof on the south wall. And I said, you can't do that. You know, Those windows are never going to see the sun. 
And, oh, don't you worry about that. And I said, well, I'm not worried about it, but if you're going to do bad solar, take my name off it because i got a reputation to maintain. And I knew, I knew it was a bluff because my name was on the grant. His wasn't. So the design committee and everybody else said, you better start listening to him. So it was, it was a challenge. Next one. But they worked out pretty nicely. They, they did some really nice finishes, and there was some sweat equity. So this is for low-income people. This is the Lopez Community Land Trust is there to make sure that the island doesn't become just rich people. You know, there's still people living in school buses out on Lopez, and that's the character of the community. So this was a way to get them out of their school buses into nice little houses, and houses that actually work well. So these houses ranged from 600 square feet up to 1,200 square feet. Some of them are one story, some of them are two stories. And the, the owners had to put up some money, and then they had to work on the houses. And they had to be on the community board. And, yeah. These came in at right around $80 a square foot. Yeah. Uh, 600 to 1,200 square feet. Yeah, that's pretty cheap. What I tell people in general, if you're building from scratch and it's 1,000 square feet to 2,500 square feet, figure about 100 bucks a square foot. Now, you can certainly make it, you know, 350 a square foot. Half the money goes into finishes. You can, you can get a house enclosed for $50, $60 a square foot, no problem, especially if it's simple. Every time you put a, a corner in the foundation, figure that's another $800. Every time you put another roof line on the house, figure that's another 1,000 to $2,000. And it adds up. So just keep it simple. They ended up with uh, little individual gas heaters, just like a room heater. Mm -mm. No, no fireplace, just a little gas heater. And that's plenty for a house that size because it's not only is the first floor plan open, it's also open between the first floor and the second floor where, like this is a vaulted ceiling back to about here. And then there's a common wall between the bedroom and that vaulted area, and there's windows in that common wall, so you can open them if you want heat and keep them closed if you want privacy. All right, next one. So this is another house I did on Lopez. This was my first passive solar off-the-grid house. I did this in 1990. So this was a while ago, too. So you can't really see the water drums, but they're behind there. You can see one line right there and one line right here. And they're sitting 16 inches below floor level. And that way, the top of the drum is exposed to the living space so it can radiate to the occupants. But it's sitting on its own little concrete slab, so we didn't have to beef up the floor system to support 3,200 pounds of water. Um, and they're plastic drums. I took their advice. This system was up on this pole, but he didn't like it because it was wiggling around a lot in the wind. And so having it on the ground is OK. You just have to be careful when you're mowing the grass. The panels do have tempered glass on the surface, so they're actually rated for golf ball sized hail. They're, they're pretty tough. And if they're mounted on the house, then they are also eligible for homeowner's insurance. So if a tree falls on it and breaks the panel, your homeowner's policy will pay for it. This is about a 400, eh, it's about a 500 watt system. So for a weekend house, this works out okay because they've got big battery banks. During the weekend, they deplete the batteries, and then the system has all week to charge those batteries back up. If this were a full-time house, that system would have to be two or three times that size. So, yeah, they're just, yeah, they're lead acid, and we decided to just go with the cheap ones because when you're learning about batteries, chances are you're going to kill them. You know, batteries don't die. Typically, people kill them. They don't keep them watered, or they don't charge them fully often enough. Once a month, you're supposed to, um, they call it floating the batteries. You overcharge them and it boils the electrolyte inside and it takes all the sulfation off of those lead plates. If you don't do that, then the sulfation builds up and for every square inch of lead plate that you've got sulfation on it, that's not going to react. And so the capacity of the battery goes down. So usually you want to start with cheap batteries until you learn how to take care of them. And you'll kill one set probably in five years or so and then you get a good set and they'll last you. Well, there's some that are actually warranted for 15 years now. So that's the other way you can go is you can pay twice as much. You can get what they call absorbed glass mat batteries, AGM. They also call them gel cells. And they never have to be watered. You can't water them. There's no caps to pull off. And they don't give off hydrogen gas when they're charging because they're sealed. So you can put them in your bedroom closet if you want. 
And they have a 15-year warranty because there's no way you can kill them. I shouldn't say that. With a good charge controller, you can't kill them. It's always possible. But, yeah. And this is a sliding glass door. So this was a pretty cheap way to get this, too. And you could get access if you wanted to vacuum up the spiders. And for the water, it doesn't circulate anywhere. It's just 55 gallons of water in each drum. And then we put a half cup of bleach in there to make sure stuff doesn't grow inside the drums. But you don't have to do anything else to it. They're sealed, so they won't evaporate. Pretty simple. No, they're all the way. There's eight drums sitting under that window seat. Yeah, you can't get at all of them. No, no. In fact, that was, that was another thing that was weird about this project. The code says any piece of glass bigger than nine square feet within 18 inches of the floor has to be tempered, period. So the way I originally had this laid out was we were going to have a separation and the bottoms of all of these, and you could open it so that you could get ventilation in the summertime, and that way the glass within 18 inches of the floor was less than nine square feet, and none of it had to be tempered. Well, the building department kicked it back and said, subject to human impact, it's got to be tempered. It's like, wait a minute, how is anybody going to get at this glass? There's 55-gallon drums full of water sitting in front of them. Well, somebody could take those drums out, and then they could use that door, and it's got to be tempered. And I was going to argue it, and the homeowner said, nah, forget it. We'll just, we'll just temper it all. So they did. So they used patio door glass here because it was cheap. And then I think these were also patio door units. You can actually buy patio door glass. It's all tempered, and it was fairly cheap. It would be tough to do in the city of Seattle because anything new that goes into a house has to have a label on it. And these didn't have labels. These were used. But Lopez was fairly <laughs> accommodating. And no, we bought them. Um, we got them from Seattle Filmworks. They were the only place where I could find black ones. You can find blue ones all over the place. There's a place called the Industrial Materials Exchange Network. It's through King County. It's IMEX. So it's metrokc.gov slash IMEX. Yeah, the IMEX directory. It's, it's all full of free stuff. You could probably Google it too, IMEX. So it's manufacturers, distributors, suppliers that have plastic bags, you know, recurring at 50 per month, and they put it in this directory, and then you can go and pick them up for free. Most of the stuff in there is free. And you can find drums that are, that are free. The reason I charge them 10 bucks a piece is because I went downtown and picked them up in my truck, and I hauled them all the way up to Lopez, so I charged them for the drums. But if you want to do it yourself, what's that? Oh, yeah. No, I got But this was one of my early ones, and, you know, in business, you always end up giving away some time at the beginning. We also did an experiment on this house with eutectic salts, which is where I found out about this. I found a guy that had a bunch of tubes of eutectic salts in his garage, and he didn't know if they had broken down yet or not. And so he sold them to me for cheap. And we put them inside the common wall because, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the next slide and see if we got a side view of the house. Now this, you can see the drums a little better. But anyway, this sticks out about three feet from the main face of the house, which is up there. And for about the first 12 feet on the second floor, it's vaulted so that the warm air in the house goes up into that vaulted area. Again, it sits against that common wall where the two bedrooms are. And there's windows. And if you want heat, you open the window. And you can get some heat from the living space downstairs. And if you don't want the heat, then you just close it off. So what we did was we put the eutectic salt tubes inside that wall in between the studs. And we figured you know, they don't weigh that much, and they would give extra thermal storage to the wall. And I think they're working pretty well. There's no way to know unless you open up the wall and take out the tubes and turn them up and down and see if they're actually sodium sulfate or if it's sodium and sulfur now. But you know, regardless, if it has weight, it still has thermal capacity. It may not be a phase change salt anymore, but perfection is the enemy of good. My dad taught me that one. He's a trauma surgeon. And for him, it meant if every stitch has to be perfect, the guy's going to bleed to death before you get him closed up. For the rest of us, it means if everything has to be just so, you're probably not going to take on very much, and you're going to accomplish even less. And good is good. You know, good is a fine goal. All right, next one. This is a house that I worked on on Whidbey Island. 
And this is also water storage. They've got curtains in front of it, which was kind of weird. Um, that was for privacy, which I never quite understood, because they sit in between bookshelves. There was a built-in bookshelf on that south wall of the living room, and inside the bookshelf there was just enough space for these water columns. Like you can buy plexiglass water columns. They come 12 inches and 18 inches in diameter, 4 feet, 5 feet, 8 feet, and 10 feet tall, and then you put dye in them. And so they're different colors. They're really kind of pretty. But they're, you know, 90 bucks a piece, and they get shipped from New Hampshire. It's the only place I could find that had UV grade plastic columns like this. Um, they're, they're from a company called Solar Components Corp. Solar Components Corporation. And I think they're in Manchester. Where they say it? Manchester, New Hampshire. Yeah, don't say their ah's too well up there. So this is uh, passive solar, direct gain. We did do, this is the hallway into the master bedroom, and we did multiple layers of sheetrock and painted it dark color in the hallway, because we, you know, who cares if the hallway's dark? You're gonna probably have a light on at night, and during the day we had all these windows, so that multiple layers of sheetrock gave us some thermal storage for the master bedroom in front of the hallway. And then the water columns were thermal mass for the rest of the house, and it was very open. This is the living room right here, and then right next to that's the dining room, and then right behind that is the kitchen. So it was, it was, it's a good house. It's sold a couple times. They also had a radiant floor, and we did PV on this house too. Let's go to the next slide and see if it shows that. There it is. I did a workshop where we installed that all those panels. I got about two dozen people to pay 50 bucks a head to come and help us put up panels. Of course, I didn't charge the client for that part. Just call me Tom Sawyer. Because, you know, people wanted to get their hands dirty with the equipment without having to buy it themselves. And so they got an all-day workshop presentation. They got to meet the homeowners that invested in this. And they got to see what the equipment was all about and how hard it really was to install. I prefer them on the roof. The reason that we did this was because there were trees. There were, this place had tree issues. In fact, if the people hadn't had lots of money, I probably would have said, you know, you're getting 60% of what this system would put out on a good site. And they paid an extra $2,000 to put them on poles, but we had to get them as far north as we possibly could. And normally, if you're going to do pole mounts like that, um, you might as well put a tracker on it. The tracker will give you another 35% worth of output from a PV system. That's worth doing. Of course, the drawback of a tracker is now you've introduced moving parts into a system that previously didn't have any. That's the beauty of, of PV is there's no moving parts. Nothing to break down. With a tracker, then you got things that can break. We set these back from the road. The road is like right here, and this is where their power line is too. And we set them back a little bit because that would just be too tempting for kids walking down the street, you know, to hang on these things. <laughs> and yeah. But, you know, now it's garden art. So. That's a very complicated question. <laughs> it's really complicated. I thought you meant round like you lay out the panels in a circle. But they're still all on the same plane. I know you're talking out of plane. Yeah. That's hard because you want the same intensity on all the panels at the same time if they're wired together. If you could do it, I mean you could, if, if the arc was going this way, you could have these panels wired into the inverter and then these panels wired into the inverter and then these panels wired into the inverter so these guys wouldn't drag down the efficiency of those. But that's the issue. Yeah, I'd try and keep them in the same plane. That gets really dicey because then you have to pick the right inverter. Most inverters have two inputs, so you can put two strings worth of panels in there. But for something like that, you would almost want two inverters, one for the ones that are facing mostly east, and one for the ones that are facing true south, and one for the ones that are facing mostly west. That would get complicated. So yeah, that's, and these people have built three solar houses since I've known them. I call them Johnny Solar Seed, because they, they go and they build solar houses, and then they sell them. And they move somewhere and they build another house and sell that one. It's pretty neat. I've worked for them twice now. So, All right, next one. Yeah, that's what they look like. This was another thing. You have, to, you have to watch the building department because they tried to tell us that these panels were exposure C. Building code says exposure B, you have to uh, design for 80 mile an hour winds. 
which is no problem. That's what most of us are. Exposure C says there's a quarter mile with no obstructions, and you have to design for 120 mile an hour winds. And you know that would have made the size of this pipe bigger. It would have made the flange at the top bigger. It would have made all the connections beefier. And I said, wait a minute. The house is exposure B. How can the panels be exposure C? That doesn't make any sense. You're either exposed for a quarter mile or you're not. And they said, well, we just want to make sure this thing is really stout. And I said, I understand. This is exposure B. We're not going overboard on this. And they didn't require an engineer stamp, which was good, because I've had people require engineer stamps before. But these systems are designed um, either by the dealer installer who's going to warranty the thing for two years minimum, or they're in, uh, designed by the distributor that's selling the equipment to the dealer installer. And they, they use the same hardware for this system as they do for microwave repeater stations up on the top of a mountain. You know, 200 mile an hour sustained winds. This is what I tried to tell the city of Seattle. I said, look, the racks, the racks are what the panels bolt to. They're $120 a piece. You know, the, the bolts, they're all stainless steel. Uh, it's $10 worth of bolts. Why would we cheap out on $120 worth of racks and $10 worth of bolts that are protecting, you know, $15,000 worth of solar panels? That's nuts. The bolts in the rack are 10 times as strong as they need to be. And I tried to use that logic, and they said, we want to see an engineer stamp. And I said, well, OK, if you have an engineer capable of looking at my engineer's report, you have an engineer capable of looking at the specs on this stuff and telling you that these things are 10 times as strong as they need to be. We want to see an engineer stamp. And I said, look, there was a 4,000-pound chiller sitting on top of that I-beam. You think 200 pounds worth of panels is going to be a problem? We want to see an engineer stamp. I paid an engineer $400 to tell us that they're 10 times as strong as they need to be. All right. Yeah. Well, now, you know, we made some lemonade. Now any system weighing less than 1,000 pounds doesn't require a building permit. So you don't have to get it engineered. All right, next one there. This is a workshop that I did over in Ellensburg. We did a 3-kilowatt wind machine, and this is what a tracker looks like, this thing up here. And we did 1.2 kilowatts on a tracker, which is the biggest array. That's 120 square feet of panels. That's about as big as you can put on one pole. And this thing, it's a dual axis, meaning it follows the sun throughout the day, and it also changes tilt for the different seasons of the year. And this is Ellensburg. I mean, they've got solar access like you wouldn't believe. No obstructions anywhere. The little shed over here is where the batteries go. So the wind turbine. See, the wind turbine was feeding back to the grid, and the solar panels were charging the batteries. The thing about wind is that solar, once it's up, you never have to mess with it. Wind, these things go about eight feet down into the ground. These were four feet in diameter, and there were four of them. And then there's cables, you know, those big honking cables. And this is the minimum size tower that you can use. Let's see if the next slide has has the wind. Yeah, look at this. I mean, this is a big honking pipe. And there's, there's guy wires. And this was a 30-foot tower. The rule of thumb for wind is you want the turbine to be 30 feet above any obstruction within 500 feet. And it doesn't matter whether that obstruction is to the side or the front or the back or wherever the wind happens to be coming from. 30 feet above any obstruction within 500 feet. And the reason for it is, is because when the wind is blowing at this turbine, and it passes the turbine, and then it hits a tree that's you know, 300 feet behind it, it creates kind of a buffeting effect on that tree. And so the turbine will sit there and go like this. It just tries to find where the best wind is, and it will, it will move around a lot, which wears out the bearings up on top of the tower. So it's, you know, a 30-foot tower is the smallest one you can get, and the other rule of thumb for wind is higher is always better. The higher up you can get it, the more wind there's going to be. But these towers, I mean, that's an 8-inch diameter Schedule 40 pipe. That's a big honking pipe. And then it's got a gin pole, and you lay the whole thing down, you put the turbine on the tower, and then you tilt it up with a, with a truck or something. And I've seen videos of a truck that wasn't quite big enough. <laughs> and they had this truck doing wheelies trying to pull this gin pole down to the ground. So wind is it's dicey stuff, and you've got to drop this thing down once a year or climb up the tower to check all the bushings and make sure that all the lubrication is happening and these bushings aren't wearing out. Because if something goes wrong with a wind machine, it will rip itself apart in a matter of seconds. So you got to make sure that everything is staying nice and <laughs> lubricated. Yeah, you had a question? 
So, you know, wind can be very cost effective. Don't ever attach it to a building because they do vibrate. And I've also seen a video of where the wind machine was attached to the garage. It was a detached garage. They weren't worried about the, the box effect because wind machines make noise. And if you've got it attached to a building, that building will amplify that noise. It's kind of like the box on a guitar. And, um, but this thing was vibrating so much, the, the rotor was a little bit out of balance, and it backed the bolts out of the wall. And they came out one morning, the inverter was laying on the garage floor because it backed eight bolts out of the plywood that it was attached to and dropped the inverter on the floor. So yeah, they do vibrate. If they're perfectly balanced, they don't, but very little in life is perfect. So they make noise, and they do vibrate, and they've got moving parts. And anyway, next one. So this is what it's about, big cables bolts, locking stuff down, making sure everything is just right so it doesn't rip itself apart. Next. Yeah, there it is again. One of these bolts didn't perfectly line up, so we had to drill through this pipe. If you try drilling through a pipe that's a quarter of an inch thick, solid steel, it took a long time. Yeah. They make DC also. And if you're going to do a, like on this project, we had 1.2 1, 1 kilowatts of PV, and I think this was a two or a three kilowatt wind machine, we had to find an inverter that could take two dissimilar strings and, and invert them both. And we did find one. I usually tell people if they really want a wind machine, look at uh, Southwest Wind Power, the Whisper. Those tend to be the quietest, the cheapest, and the most efficient. And they have good longevity. I'm not a wind guy, so I probably shouldn't even say. I know they're cheaper than solar, and they do qualify for tax credits. There's an energy production credit of three cents a kilowatt hour through the Fed for wind machines. Yeah, I'm not sure what the cost is. All right, next one. This is a house that I designed in Duval, and it's a passive solar house. They came to me with the design pretty much laid out, and I did the structural engineering on it and did the solar calculations and did the drawings to get it through the building department. And this up here, above the top roof up here, that's this stuff. So that's, that's about 1.2 kilowatts of unisolar. That's about half of the electricity that the house is using. Yeah. And if that were a dark blue roof or a black roof, we call this stealth solar. Nobody will ever know it's there. National Association of Home Builders built a townhouse in Frederick, Maryland. And I did a tour of it when I was at the national conference a couple years ago. And you can't even see it. You can there's two roofs that have solar on them and one roof that doesn't. And the only reason you can tell is because one roof that doesn't is like one shade blue lighter. But it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And, and you don't have to worry about hurting it. It's on a stainless steel metal backing. It's all encased in UV stabilized Teflon. It's been around for about 10. So, yeah, and they have done a bunch of destructive testing on it because that is the one concern with amorphous panels is the efficiency going to go down over time? So far, so good. And if it's warranted for 20 years, it's, it's a good company. I would trust their warranty. I bought stock in the company, so I think, it's a, I think it's a good product. So this is the passive solar. I also had an overhang designed over these windows. And it, it's not going to be that much harder to add afterwards. You can buy little half trusses that will just bolt onto the side of the house. They didn't like the way it looked as well with the overhang, so they said, eh, let's live with it for a year and see if we really need that overhang. They could also drop shades over that, you know, movable. But I did my old house. This is the house I did in Tenasket. It's completely off the grid. They're six miles from the nearest power line. And they were concerned about Y2K, so this, they were also worried about wildfires. Yeah, this house is made out of rastra, so it is fireproof. Uh, concrete blocks with expanded polystyrene. The only part that's not is the little cupola sitting up on top. We called it the watchtower. That was actually an afterthought. The homeowner was looking at the plans and he's going, you know, we have a killer view and there's no place in the house where you can just sit and look anywhere you want, just see the whole view. So the whole roof is trusses, which I like because it's, there's nothing bigger than a two by six in that whole roof. And they're all engineered and they go up really fast. So we just, that is I think that's eight by eight. So we took out three trusses and we added two girder trusses and a couple of cross pieces for framing. And it wasn't a hard thing to do. And turns out that's the only place on the property he could get cell phone coverage. So <laughs> it was 
was a good thing because he didn't have a landline either. It was uh, he was going to have to go with a satellite phone. It's not the house itself is 2,400 square feet, two stories, and then this building in front is a clinic. Um, this guy invented neurocranial restructuring, which if you've ever heard, I'd never heard of it. What it is is they shove balloons up your nose and they inflate them and they move the bones in your head and face around. To me it sounded like voodoo. My dad was a surgeon, so if it's not bleeding, it's not broken. But for people with sinus problems, migraines, balance issues, all these things that Western medicine has had no luck with, um, He's a miracle worker. The guy gets $1,000 for a half hour session, and he trains doctors from all over the world how to do this. And so that's what the clinic was for, was to bring doctors in from everywhere so he could train them on neurocranial restructuring. It was, this was an interesting project. He's got like two and a half kilowatts of PV. He had a three kilowatt wind machine and 2,000 gallons of propane. So I think the next slide will show you a little bit more what's going on. Now there's the PV and the wind. And those were tracking, tracking systems. There was no shortage of money here. Next one. I don't think I show a picture of the tank farm. That's what I called it. You know, He's just rows of propane tanks. Like I said, he was worried about Y2K. He thought the world was going to end, and he was going to be on his own out here. So he was all prepared. So this is two different inverters. One was for the PV, and one was for the wind. Those are trace inverters, which is now Xantrac. This box here is battery box, he had a big battery system. This little guy up here, I think, is the charge controller. And this is what Rastra looks like from the inside. They're uh, styrofoam and concrete blocks, and they use recycled polystyrene, and they glue them all together. And instead of a panel inside and a panel outside with a solid concrete wall in the center, they're blocks that have seven inch diameter nodes every 15 inches, vertically and horizontally. So you lay these blocks together on urethane glue, you set the steel into these nodes, they call them, and then you fill it full of sloppy concrete, and it makes a post and beam structure. So it, it uses 40% less concrete than a normal ICF wall. And yet, you're not isolated from your mass. And it's still, we use 16-inch blocks. And they claimed an R value of, I think it was like 48. That was dynamic R value. I figured it was probably more in the range of 28. But that's still better than code. Code is 19, so. Figured it was, it was still a good house. That's a perfect system for passive cooling because what you're looking to do for passive cooling is vent high up on the south and west. So you want your vents high up on the hot sides of the house, and then you have vents low down on the north and east. So for every cubic foot of air that goes out that south and west vent, you're going to pull a cubic foot of air from somewhere. And if you're careful about where that somewhere is, you can do some really nice stuff. Vents low down on the north and east, shady side of the building. And at night, you can do it. We call it nocturnal cooling. I used to call it night flushing, but that sounds bad. But yeah, I did a house in Goldendale where she has a heat pump, and she hasn't turned it on. The house is buried in the ground, you know, the, the northeast and west sides. It's got window wells so that you can have emergency egress from the bedrooms, and you can get natural ventilation. So let's go to the next one. We'll try and fly through these a little. Oh, there's the tank farm. Yeah. They also have a wood boiler. So their, their heating system is passive solar is number one. Let's go to the next one and see what that, I think that, let's go again, Rick. So this is the mechanical system. It's got a hydronic slab on the first floor and lightweight concrete slab on the second floor. Plus we had a seasonal storage rock bin designed for this house. So underneath that bump out, the sunroom on the south side, let's see, 14 feet wide, 42 feet long, and 9 feet deep, we were going to fill this with pre-washed fist-sized river rocks. And then we were going to separate it into three rock bins with horizontal metal, sheet metal. And that way we could charge the bin from the bottom in the summertime and work our way up. And then in the wintertime, we could start discharging it from the bottom and then work our way up. And it, I think it would have worked pretty well. You know, it would have been a, a hybrid system for sure because we were going to have fans on both ends so we could charge and discharge from any elevation inside the bin we wanted to so we could determine how hot air we wanted into the house. Um, it would have been a pretty sophisticated system, but oh, they lived there for a year and the, this system was working so well they just said, you know, moving 20 tons of rock, we're just not sure we want to go through that. I said, hey, your son's on the basketball team, pay the kids five bucks an hour. 
You know, set up a conveyor belt. The reason I say pre-washed is because you're blowing air through this rock bin. And fist sized so that you have enough heat storage capacity in the core of the rock, but you also have enough air space that you can actually charge these rocks. And river rocks, because they're round, if you get crushed rock, then it's all got angled surfaces and they're going to tend to pack together too closely and you don't have control how much air is moving through there. Yeah, and, and the nice thing about a hydronic system too is each one of these pumps represents a zone. That pump costs about $40. The aquastat that tells the pump when to turn on and off, that costs about $60. So you can do another zone for 100 bucks, you know, a little extra piping, but then you don't have to heat the rooms that you don't want. Or you want to keep your bedroom 60 degrees and you want to have the living room 70 degrees, it's no problem. You just have a little mixing valve that the water comes out of the boiler at 100, 120 or so, and then the mixing valve puts in just enough cold water to get it to the temperature you want it. Here at, at the hydro panel is what they call this area. It's easier to do copper piping because it's rigid and it looks nice and that's what plumbers like to do. But for the rest of the house, I would use PEX for sure. There's another system that I really like for not only potable water, but also this called a mana block system. All the water piping in your house comes back to one area. And it's inside this little cabinet and there's an isolation valve for each one. So if a pump dies, you just close off the ball valve undo the pump, you don't have to recharge the whole system or bring the whole system down to work on it. Pretty slick. All right, next. But this is passive solar, you know? If we could go backwards, I'd love to, to toggle between mechanical, passive solar, you know? So you want to do as much of this as you can. This is simple. There's no pumps, there's no valves, there's no electric operators, there's nothing to go wrong, there's nothing to maintain. Wash your windows once a year if you want to. And that's, that's all there is to it. Next. And that's what it looks like from the south side. We did a metal roof. Um, we actually did do wood, wood wall on the second floor, that's right. Because we started doing the calculations and this one did have to have a structural engineer stamp because it was Rastra. And the engineer started looking at it and this upper wall sits back 14 feet from this wall and supporting a concrete wall on a beam that was spanning 42 feet. You know, even if we had a couple posts in there, it was just, it was too much. So we made it a wood wall and we covered it with hardy planks, which is cement and wood siding. So it, it's got a better fire rating. And they do have a gas that, that flew up there. It's for the, the propane boiler. Yeah. Oh, uh, just stucco. Cementious stucco. That's one of the things I like about Rastra as opposed to normal ICFs. Normal insulating concrete form, you've got to attach chicken wire to it and then go over that. Rastra is so rough that you just skim coat it. Plaster on the inside, stucco on the outside, you're done. There's no blood lath or anything you have to mess with. Okay, next one. Uh, this is a house that I helped design for Iron Straw Group. And they train at-risk youth to build straw bale structures over in Ellensburg. They have since left the state because the New Zealand government made them an offer they couldn't refuse. You know, they've been trying to do workshops and, and teach people about straw bale and there just isn't a lot of support for it around here. So the New Zealand government learned about what they were doing and they said, we'll give you a free building lot, we'll give you a stipend for the first year, you set up workshops, we'll get you going, we want this. So they moved to New Zealand. But this house is load-bearing straw bale if you're ever going to do straw bale, try and do load bearing because the building departments love to see post and beam because they can put a number on that post and put a number on that beam and the connectors, they can pull them out of a catalog and they know that it all meets code. But those walls are certainly capable of supporting 400 pounds per lineal foot. I mean, a two by four will do that. So obviously an 18 inch wide straw bale will certainly do it. And three inches of stucco on the outside, two inches of plaster mm. on the inside, and then you've got straps that go all the way from the foundation up over the top of the wall and hold it down to the foundation. And then you've got trusses that are holding everything. I mean, this thing is built. This is a, this is a very sturdy house. Um, and I got it through Kittitas County without an engineer stamp for a load-bearing straw bale house. It's just a matter of knowing what the building department is looking for and giving it to them up front. Because if they think you're trying to get away with something, then they can, they can make your life very difficult. But if you, I showed them all the calculations on the headers above the windows and doors, and we gave them the lateral load analysis from the University of Washington for load-bearing straw bale, and they looked at it and they said, yeah, this looks pretty good, okay. So 
Next one. I would have done the roof a little differently when they first came to me. This, this house had all kinds of corners in it. And this is in Kashmir, so they get plenty of snow. Um, we still ended up with four valleys, which is still a place where snow is going to collect. But, you know, it works. And they got a killer view. <laughs> they offered me a building lot on the back part of their 12 acres. And I just thought, oh, eastern Washington. I wouldn't mind it in the spring and the fall, but summer and winter, nah, I don't think so. Hot weather weenie, right here. All right, next one. I know, the one at you, but yeah, I like the mesh out better. And this is as far back from the house as I could get <laughs> to take a picture of it, because it drops off big time. Um, but those, those are the bales. We had tarps everywhere, because when we were building it, we put up all the walls for this house in one weekend with semi-skilled labor. It's basically just jamming some rebar in there, taking the bales, making sure that the folded side is um, alternated. Because when, when a bale is made, it folds the hay over, and one side is cut, not hay, it's straw. One side is cut and one side is folded. And the cut side will compress more than the folded side will. So you want the cut side alternating inside to outside, inside to outside, or else by the time you get up to the roof, your wall is going to look kind of like this. So, but it was, it was a fun weekend. We had a good time. Next one. There's the other side. And you can do cool stuff. You can make curves, and you just take a chainsaw and, and cut it. You can make curved headers. Because it's just plaster and bales, you just take off some straw and jam it into the cracks. And it was, it was very creative. Yeah, if you were going to do straw bale on this side of the mountains, I would do at least a three-foot overhang. About three feet. Yeah. And I would probably also make the... This is one thing I don't like about straw bale, is it takes a lot of concrete. This is an 18-inch wide wall, so number one, you're losing a lot of floor space. And if you've paid a lot of money for your land, you've got to consider that as part of the cost of that bale house, is that extra foot of wall that you're not having use of. It's just wall. And then the concrete under it and the extra roof to cover it, it's, um, it's kind of a cool system, but I haven't seen one come in cheaper than a stick-built house yet. Even with, even with free labor, it's still, it's very labor intensive and the finishing, there's still a lot of detail to the finishing. And if you're going to do it, I would pay somebody to do the stucco on the outside. You can do it yourself, but man, that is a miserable job and it's a long job. Because you have to set this stuff on the, you have to tie it to the bales, you have these wires that you tie the stuff called blood lath. And there's a reason they call it that. It's metal that they just push like this and it's got all these nasty little sharp edges to it, and then you, you stucco over that. And you have to do minimum three coats. You do a base coat, a scratch coat, and a finish coat. So you're going over that whole house three times. And somebody with a sprayer can do the whole thing in about a week. Doing it by hand, a month would be fast. So, all right, and that's their view. <laughs> that's all right. And that's the PV system. They're totally off-grid. They're in Kashmir up Coyote Ridge Road. Solar panels get the nicest views, don't they? Mm. All right, next one. Uh, this is an interesting system. If you look at the roof of this thing, there's two evacuated tube collector systems because they've got radiant slabs on the basement, first, and second floor. So they've got lightweight concrete, gypcrete on the second and third floors, and they're using those evacuated tubes to heat that water, at least significantly heat it. And then you can see where the roof is kind of bumped up above the other roof. What they did was, we've got cupolas, so this is kind of a complicated system. This is not truly passive. This is definitely a hybrid system. What they did was they bumped the roofing up a little bit above the, ma the main roof, and so the airspace underneath that roof gets really hot. And that airspace is vented up to the cupola, and then the cupola has a big uh, squirrel cage fan in a chase that goes all the way down to the lower floor. And then each floor has a little thermostat hooked to a little fan, and you set that thermostat where you want it, and the little sensors tell it if the air inside that vertical chase is warmer than the living space is, then it turns on the fan and it blows warm air into your house. Wow. It's, I mean, that's a complicated system. In the summertime, that cupola opens up, and so you're, ideally you're pulling warm air out of the house and it's venting out the top. It's... You know, this was Tom Balderston's idea, and I told him I would help him with it, and we even got Ecotope involved to help us size the fans and the sensors, and, but it's complicated, and usually simple is better. 
And it's got a Rastra um, first floor. I helped put the Rastra up to that place. That's like two blocks from my old house. It's right on the edge of the park. So yeah, try and keep it simple. Next panel, this is single pane glass because there's no storage in this system at all. Single pane glass, airspace, and then um, selective surface attached to aluminum T channel. It's not really a channel, it's just a flat piece of aluminum and then a fin on the back. And the selective surface is on the flat part and then the fin is where the air comes by. So the selective surface gets you know, 140, 150 degrees on a nice sunny day. And then he pulls air from the house over the back and these fins give up the heat. And he's getting 42.6% of his space heat from this system. The guy was an astrophysicist. He had a million data points on this house before he, we even started designing it. He knew exactly what the time lag was, what the thermal capacity of the house was, how long it took heat from the south side to get to the north side. He even put a little air dam around the stairwell because he figured out that the air was moving upstairs too fast. And so he put this little one foot cardboard air dam and that kept the heat downstairs for long enough that it would charge up the ceiling before it headed upstairs, which kept the downstairs warmer. So I did a, I did a talk on this project at the National Solar Conference down in Portland and it was funny. He had graphs and charts that you know, any engineer would drool over. And this is a reflector I was talking about. This is polished aluminum. He went all out. You could use foil face polyisoboard. You could take some um, extruded polystyrene and spray paint it silver or white and it would work pretty well. But this was polished aluminum and he had the same stuff that they use for RVs on the back of it. So when it's folded up, it looks really nice. And he's bouncing another 30, 35% up through the glass. And then at night, it folds up. You can see the cutouts for the windows. In fact, let's see the next picture. I wonder if it's got it. Yeah, there it is folded up. He's still got a little trim work to do around the sides. But it's a great daytime heater. This thing really cranks during the day. There is no storage. The house itself is the storage. And he didn't add any extra thermal mass. And 42.6% of his space heat. Now don't ask me how much he paid for this, because he did most of the work himself. But he went with top of the line materials for everything. So I finally got it out of him. He, he spent about five grand on this, which is a fair amount for, for a heating system. But it's still less than 10 or 20 for a heat pump. And there's no maintenance, you know. It's, it's there. It's done. Nope. He said his, his finest moment was when he was messing around with it, finishing something off, and somebody drove by and she stopped and she goes, is that solar as well as being beautiful? And he just, he just started beaming. He's like, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> yeah, solar doesn't have to be ugly. If, you, if you're willing to spend the money on it, you can make it look pretty nice. This is called a thermosiphon air panel. It's called a tap. So the sunlight passes through the glass. There's about a four inch air space behind the glass. And then there's selective surface on aluminum fins behind it. And so sunlight hits that selective surface, gets really hot, heats up the aluminum, and then they're pulling air across those fins in the back, and the air comes in at the bottom and out at the top. And then he's got, I think he's got one intake and one supply on each side of the wall, and they go to different parts of the house. And he does have it boosted with a fan, so it's not entirely passive, but it's, it's pretty simple. This whole system only takes up this much space. Even a trom wall takes up about this much. The advantage of this is it takes up very little space. It's very controllable. So if he wants more heat in the upstairs den, he just sets the thermostat, and the thermostat turns on a little booster fan, and it pulls air out of this thermosiphon air panel. Um, a trom wall is pretty much limited to how hot it got that day, and it's, it's not very controllable. This is a very controllable system. Hydronic, that's another whole animal, because Trying to heat water and then circulate it somewhere else is difficult. You almost have to heat it with something where you're getting high temperatures because you're going to lose some in transit. So you really need temperatures uh, at least 100 degrees so that by the time you're getting where you want to go, it's at least 80. Because anything below 80 isn't going to do you much good. Uh, yeah, hydronic is complicated. I'm, I'm still learning about it. Right. Yeah, there it is all all laid down, shiny. Yeah, he did a nice job on it. And this cantilever, it's set right on underneath the cantilever. That second floor always bumped out a foot over, over the lower floor. So it was kind of a natural doing it. You know, a lot of people that have solar houses, 
they, it makes them pay attention to what's going on outside. Like right now, if you had a passive solar house, you'd probably be better off to, to close the, the drapes because you're not getting much gain right now. But earlier in the day, it would have been cranking. So you're minimizing heat loss and maximizing heat gain. Next one. This is what we used to think you had to do. That's facing true south. It's at the optimum angle for, for collection. This is down in Eugene. That's a solar heart, which is a pretty good system, but, but ugly. You know, it, it is. And you don't have to do this. The efficiency between this and one, let's go to the next one, I think maybe, yeah, and this, there's probably 5% difference in efficiency. And this one, you know, this looks pretty good. It's on a gable end. They didn't have a roof that was facing the right direction. They set it up on a wooden system, so there's nothing bigger there than a 4x4. Four four. Panels don't weigh that much. And they stained them to match the house, and it kind of ties in. That's doing 50% of the domestic hot water for a family of five. And that was probably three or four thousand dollars back, you know, I don't know, ten years ago. Okay, next. That's another one. That's for a bigger family. And they did set it up on the south roof to keep it out of the way. And they've got adjustable tilt. Racks, you can get racks that you can go out and tilt them up manually. And that will make a difference. If, if you don't mind climbing up on your roof twice a year, then you can tilt them up in the wintertime and tilt them down in the summertime. And this is evacuated tubes for a house that I helped with over on Crown Hill. This was a remodel. This is the south side. So we got this overhang to help shade this. These windows were so small we didn't worry too much about the overhang. These windows, there was no good way to get a decent overhang there. And the upper ones, again, there was not much we could do. This was a remodel where they finished off their basement. So they hammered up the old concrete slab, which was worthless. They put in good insulation and then a hydronic slab. And they're heating the hydronic slab and their domestic hot water with those evacuated heat pipes up on the roof. And then a certain amount of passive solar, too. They had lath and plaster walls, so they had like an inch and a half of plaster inside this house. And doing the calculations, it turned out that the plaster was plenty of mass. We didn't have to add any extra. But you can't count the floor on the basement as thermal mass. Can you tell me why? Exactly. Yeah, it's got hot water pipes going through it. We got a, a backup heating system, the solar up there, keeping that floor at 80 to 85 degrees. And even if the sun is shining directly on it, you might get it up to 90 degrees, but it's like trying to pour water into a glass that's already full. The greater the temperature difference between two objects, the faster the heat transfer. If you've got almost no temperature difference, your rate of heat transfer is really slow. It doesn't make much sense. So that's what it looks like a little closer up. We did do that overhang because I, I thought it was important. This is a pretty good sized door. And this is, this is nice living space. And in the summertime, they've already got you know those two windows above it that have no real shading. I thought they probably ought to try and get some shading for that lower one. And it tied in OK. Not bad. Next. And there's the. There's the heat pipes. That's what they look like. They come in 20 and 30 tube configuration. Yeah, they're, they're tougher than they look. In fact, when I first got that, the, that's a little sample one. I have a radiant slab in my old office, and I set the thing down, and it fell over right on the concrete. I just thought, great, I just paid $100 for this thing, and I opened my eyes and looked. And didn't even break the seal. So, yeah, they're tougher than they look. It's all, I think it's a 15-year warranty on the, on the tubes that they won't fog and that they'll keep producing, and two-year parts and labor. And you get sales tax exemption, and you get the federal tax credit for heating. And this is Jeremy's house. He's got tubes that he's heating water pipes with. And she's also doing, this is Pam. She's the current president of Solar Washington. Best thing I did as president was get her to take my place. Um, so she's doing big time, rainwater catchment, Hot water, they got, see, you can see another system up above because they're doing space heat and domestic hot water with it. And then they've got six kilowatts of PV up on the roof. So they're charging their electric car. They're using all the, you know, all the electricity for their house is coming from their, from their solar panels. So they're committed, big time. Six. That's about 600 square feet of solar. This is one of the oldest evacuated systems I know of. This is uh, Darren Emmons. 
out in North Bend. He heats that hot tub. He keeps it at 102 degrees all year round with those solar panels. And he's got trees, but he, it, it works. He's got a gas boiler inside that little house, and he's never turned the thing on. It's, they're working. And that's North Bend. They get 128 inches of rain a year in North Bend. It's a lot more than Seattle. Yeah, people don't realize there's that big a discrepancy between the foothills and, and the coastal, but it's, it's a lot. But he's got it at the optimum angle for winter collection because that's when he needs it. Next one. Close up. I don't know what happened. And you don't ever have to wash these either. At that angle, the rain will keep them plenty clean. Next one. There's a storage tank down in the shed. And so this thing will heat the antifreeze up to about 150 degrees on a sunny day. If it's sunny at all, on, on a cloudy day, like on a day like today, you'd probably be getting 120 degree out of it because it was sunny for a while. And it doesn't take very long. Um, in fact, I had one of these tubes sitting in my booth at the Shoreline Solar Fair, and it was just sitting on the table, and I had one of those easy ups. So it was never in the sun. And I was going to go set it in the sun, and I touched the, the bulb right here just for the heck of it, and it was too hot to hold. Just from the radiant transfer from the bottom of the easy up down to the selective surface inside this tube. So it doesn't take very long to get this thing hot. And he's only keeping the hot tub at 102. So even on the worst day, this will be making 80 degree water. And so on those days, you know, he's got good insulation and he probably just doesn't go out there if it's that cold and that lousy. Um, there's a manifold, that black box at the top, that has antifreeze flowing through it. And the antifreeze picks up the heat from these bulbs because there is no water flowing from this tube into the storage tank. Um, this is a closed system. One of the reasons that these work so well is this joint right here between the glass and the copper. This is a patent that they've had for 18 years, I think. And so you'll start to see these things coming out from China. They're not the same. Um, they're, they're not as efficient. They break seals right here a lot of times. They're about half the cost, but they don't work nearly as well. And they don't have the same kind of technology. So you're just running antifreeze through the manifold. The antifreeze goes down into the storage tank and gives up its heat to the water from the hot tub. Because you don't want to run hot tub water up through all this plumbing. It would deteriorate it pretty quick. And so it just heats the antifreeze. The antifreeze heats the hot tub. Exactly. So there's a sensor in the hot tub and there's a sensor in the storage tank. And when it says that you want more heat in the hot tub, it looks over here at the tank, and if the tank's got heat to give, then it circulates. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. I think his is 80 gallons. It's not that big. Mm -mm. Nope, there's still one inlet and one outlet. The only place where you've got T's is where it would be taking water from the boiler, the conventional system, or from the solar storage tank. And that's just a, a T and a, and a sensor and a valve. So it's just mechanical stuff. Mm, that's a good question. He said if the hot tub's empty or in the summertime and this thing is making tons of heat, how do you get rid of this heat? That's a problem. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have blankets that cover these things up because in the summertime, this thing will make more hot water than you can possibly use. You can be giving it to your neighbors and still be watering your lawn with it. So you do have to have some kind of heat dump, either a pool or a hot tub, or you just cover up part of the array. And that's okay, too. We found some really cool reflective material that's UV stabilized that we'll start using for blankets. And then it's a matter of playing around with it. How much of the array do you cover up? Um, because we have had problems, not on this side of the mountain so much, but in eastern Washington, that, that house I told you about in Goldendale, where she's never turned on her heat pump, um, she had a hot water system like this up on her roof, and in the summertime, she had a geyser going because there is a pressure relief valve to make sure that this thing doesn't explode the storage tank because if you keep pumping 150 gallon or 150 degree water into a storage tank, that storage tank is going to build up pressure, and you know you don't want the thing exploding, so there's a pressure relief valve on it, and it'll spew water. And she had a geyser up on her roof, and the guy that installed the system, you know, he didn't really think about it, so it, it was safe. It was all done to code but he hadn't thought about what to do with that excess heat in the, in the summertime. So it's something we're fine tuning. So it's not a safety issue because there are safety things in place, but it's definitely, you'd like to be using all the heat that the system can produce all the time. 
But if you size it for wintertime use, it's going to be oversized for summertime. So it's, it's a trade-off. Go to the next one. This is the system for Seattle City Light. There we are putting it together. I wanted to do that as a workshop, but they wouldn't let me because they didn't want a bunch of people up on their roof that they had to worry about insurance. I think it's just they didn't want to show everybody how ignorant they were about PV. And they're better now. This was four years ago. So they've learned a lot since then. That's Mike Nelson, the guy standing up. He's one of my heroes. Done more for solar than anybody else in the state. All right, next one. Maybe, I'll, maybe we'll see the steel I-beam structure. There it is. And you might even, oh darn, the chiller is sitting right over here. I love the picture that shows that big old chiller. A chiller is a, a commercial heating ventilation, uh, heating and cooling system. You know, it's monstrous and it's got all kinds of liquid in it. Anyway, so these are adjustable racks. You just take out those two bolts and you slide the rack down and you can change the tilt for, uh, for summertime or for wintertime use. So that's on the North Service Center, 97th and Stone. You can't really see it from the street. Uh, there is one part, if you walk about a block and a half away, you can just see it. But if you asked them, they'd probably let you go up there and look at it. All right, next one. This is conventional power. You know, whatever people talk about how hydroelectric is so green, this is the reality. This is millions and millions of cubic yards of concrete. It's these monster pipes up here at the top that take that water and run it down the hillside to get enough drop so you can run these huge turbines. And then walkie towers, you know. And I think the next picture probably shows um, scale. If you can focus this a little bit. These are cars <coughs> over here. Other way. Yeah, this gives you an idea just how big this thing is. You know, those are cars down there in that parking lot. This is huge. You know, big resources but ugly, and these walkie towers going across, the, going across the countryside happens as we count on this hydroelectric power. And remember when we had the big, our, our price hikes, it was like four years ago. Um, normally what they do is the same thing river runners do. They watch the weather, and they know that, say, it's, it's June, you know, end of May, beginning of June, got lots of snow in the mountains, you watch for that weather. And if it's hot Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the level in the Metau River or the Acma or the, or the Wenatchee is going to double. So the rafters like, yeah, let's go. And the power guys are going, yeah, we'll sell some to California. Man, we're going to have all kinds of water coming downstream this weekend. So they were doing these short-term contracts with California, and they were, they were you know, promising to give them all this power. Well, the river went from 3,600 cubic feet per second down to 2,500. It should have gone up to 10,000. I was watching it. I know the math, how I run it every spring. First weekend in June, I've hit high water 60% of the time. And it went from 3,600 down to 2,500. And we're going, what happened to the water? And the guys with the power contracts were going, holy crap, we are in big trouble because we just promised to sell all this power to California. And not only don't we have excess, we don't even have enough to supply our own loads. So the, the price for electricity on the open market went from $40 a megawatt to 1,200 in one day. In one day, I mean, that's volatility, 40 to 1,200. So that's, that's one of the problems of hydroelectric. Plus, we've got 23 varieties of salmon that are on the endangered species list. And if it's a choice between making power and giving the rivers enough water for the salmon, we're still making power. And the BEPA is in danger of getting sued because of that, because the Endangered Species Act says very clearly that this has to be a top priority. Making power is, you know, there's other ways to get power. We can fire up those coal plants. They did away with the Clean Air Act during 9-11 uh, because we needed power, and so there's all kinds of diesel generators that they can bring online, and coal plants. They did away with a bunch of the environmental restrictions so that we could burn more coal, and you know, our, our priorities are pretty clear at this point. But we're changing things, so let's go to the next one and see. Okay, so that's what conventional power looks like, even from hydroelectric or coal. You've got to have big wires going somewhere. And, all right, next. And this is what we're trying to protect. And next one. And this is one of the ways to do it. You know, this is a house that's 600 feet above the Stillaguamish Valley in Oso. It's getting 50% of its face heat from the sun. It's getting all of its electricity from that PV array up there. Uh, this right here is a rainwater catchment cistern. It's about 1,500 gallons. There's another 300 or 3,000 gallon cistern coming off the outbuilding. They were required to drill a well to get a permit, but the building department never came back to see if the well was actually plumbed to the house, which it's not. It's 300 feet down the valley. You know, It would have taken twice as much solar to pump the water up another 300 feet. 
So we, you know, we drilled the well, and then we did rainwater catchment. <laughs> so they do have a well, but and this is a raster foundation. One of the cool things they did with this house is he's got three circuits in the house. One of the circuits is for DC, so that if his voltage inverter dies, he's still got lights, he's still got refrigeration, he's still got his well pump. DC appliances are a little more expensive, but they also last longer. They don't produce electromagnetic fields, and they will work perfectly well without an inverter. They'll come right off the battery bank. He also has another circuit that uses a square wave inverter, because a, an, an expensive inverter is about a dollar a watt, and it will produce a beautiful sine wave. You know, better than the utility gives you. The, the quality you get out of a UL listed true sine wave inverter is better than the utility gives you. Um, but they're expensive, they're a dollar a watt. You can do one for about half that price, which produces a square wave. And your computer doesn't care. It's got its own power source. It'll take pretty much any kind of energy you give it and it'll work just fine. Um, a good stereo wants a true sine wave. A DeWalt charger, amazingly, wants a true sine wave or else it won't turn off and you'll destroy your battery. But, so he's got a square wave, a DC circuit, and a true sine wave inverter. He's got three, three circuits inside the house. The sunroom is set about three steps below the living space, and we've got double hung windows in between the sunroom and the living space so that if you want warm air, you pull the bottom of the window up. If you want hot air, you pull the top down. If you want full transfer, you open the door. And this is another 50% solar house. This is made from Cedar Homes of Washington. And again, they take small diameter cedar trees, they get the wood off them, and then they put six or eight inches of styrofoam in between, and they make structural insulated panels out of them. And they're really pretty. But that's the reason that this, this thing is to this vertical post. That's what's holding up the ridge beam, because we, d we couldn't really bury the post inside the wall, because the wall is continuous styrofoam. So it makes a very tight house. I set this at the optimum angle for winter collection because I didn't know any better. <laughs> you know, they didn't want to run their generator at all. Never. Don't want to turn it on. We have it for emergencies. So we had to get the maximum output that we could in the wintertime. Knowing what I know now, it doesn't make any difference. 25% of your output is coming you know, between the fall equinox and the spring equinox. It's not worth it to set the panels at that optimum angle. You're better off to get what you can, buy a couple extra batteries, and run the generator in December. You know, you're not going to get around it. They have to do that so that they can really float the batteries so that they can get the sulfation off the plate. So, but it looks, I don't know, it looks kind of cool. I just found out recently this house was put into a textbook. I don't know which one, and they never asked me, but it is, it's kind of a neat house. It was for sale. It sits above the Stiligwamish Valley. And we have a Tula Kivi wood stove. If, you, if you're going to do a wood stove and you've got lots of money, Tula Kivi is the way to go. It's, it's wrapped in soapstone, and soapstone has the best thermal capacity of any solid that we know of. So the flue on this Tula Kivi can go 20 feet horizontal before it has to have any vertical rise. That's how tight it is. And I, I've got another picture that isn't on a slide. Right where the, the flue comes out of the firebox, there's a little shiny spot, and that's where the cat sleeps. Because even though you know, it's, it's hot, that stove gets really hot, you can set your hand right on the soapstone and it's just warm. One bundle, one arm full of wood like this will heat that house for 12 hours, even when it's really cold out. T-U-L-I-K-I-V-I. Tulikivi. It's made in Finland, so it's heavy, and you've got to ship it. It's about a $10,000 stove. But it's tight. It's got a bread warmer. It's got cooktop. It's, it's the most efficient wood stove in the world. The best. Thanks. Go forth and solarize.